Hello and welcome to this special webinar on Osprey Migration. I'm Tim McCrill. I'm the founder of the Osprey Leadership Foundation um, and also, as you may know, work with the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation on lots of um, different projects, including with ospreys and white-tailed eagles. Now, I have a slight confession to make because what you should be watching now is a recording of the webinar as it went out live. However, what I forgot to do at the very start was press record. So I'm going to redo the first 10 minutes and then we will go into the um, live recording. Um, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who joined um, on Friday night when this was recorded live. Um, and thank you to everyone who's expressed an interest at watching uh, the recording. So I wanted to make sure you saw the talk in its entirety um, rather than just um, 10 minutes after the beginning. Anyway, so without further ado, um, the talk tonight really um, covers various aspects of osprey migration. But before I go into the specifics of the amazing journey that individual ospreys do and that we now know about through satellite tracking, I thought it's useful to just put this all in context. And one of the first things to really consider is the osprey's global distribution. And it is a truly global bird. It's got a real cosmopolitan distribution. So, um, you know, just looking at this map, you'll see that ospreys occur at northern latitudes throughout North America, uh, in Europe, and all of those, all of the ospreys that are breeding at northern latitudes migrate south for the um, for the winter. So, if you look at in, in Europe, if you look in the UK, then our birds typically use the or they use the East Atlantic Flyway that takes them down through France, Spain. Um, some linger in. Iberia in Spain and Portugal for the winter, but most then go across the Sahara Desert down to West Africa, and there's lots more on that a bit later. Um, but then if you go further east in Europe, if you go up to uh, Scandinavia, then the birds in Sweden and Norway, they typically use a similar flyway to the birds from the UK, but the birds in Finland use them generally, not all, but generally use a more eastern route that takes them down through Eastern Europe, through the Middle East, and then down the Rift Valley into East Africa and some Finnish birds are known to migrate all the way down to South Africa. So they do do a, a staggeringly long migration. As you continue east into Russia, then of course the southerly migration is again slightly different and the birds in Eastern Russia actually migrate south into Asia um, and, and winter in various countries in Asia, including India. And there's some, been some really fantastic recent satellite tracking of, of ospreys that have migrated from uh, from northern Russia right the way down into India for the for the winter. So that's northern ospreys. If you go further south, um, then what you tend to find is that the populations at more southerly latitudes are generally sedentary. So if you look in Europe, for example, um, places like uh, the Mediterranean, where they breed in uh, Corsica, many of the Corsican birds are sedentary or they just make very limited um, post-breeding movements. Some will make longer migrations, but many just remain in the Mediterranean for the whole winter. Uh, and then if you go elsewhere, if you go to say the Cape Verde Islands, which are off the coast of um, West Africa, those birds are sedentary. And likewise, if you go across to North America, um, the, the ospreys breeding in places like Florida don't move south for the winter. But it's interesting, actually, if you look at the distribution of ospreys in North America, uh, those birds breeding in the kind of eastern part of North America in, uh, say, New Hampshire, New Hampshire and basically New England um, in the US, and then also in eastern parts of Canada, Canada, they fly th down the eastern seaboard of, of North America and they pass through the areas where those birds are sedentary, um, but then continue south through the Caribbean and down into South America and winter in places like uh, Venezuela, Colombia, um, and down into Brazil. And some ospreys, I mean, I remember one particular satellite tag bird that was uh, followed all the way from Long Island um, near New York. Uh, so it's, you know, saw a real kind of urban landscape when it was breeding. And then it, it wintered on, a, on the River Amazon. So, you know, just the birds, the landscapes they experienced in their lifetime is really quite staggering. If you then go across to Western, North America, then the birds there use a slightly different route. So their migration takes them down through Central America and then down into South America and to countries like Argentina. So the, the message really, the take home message is that Northern populations of ospreys are migratory. They go South for the winter, um, but those that breed at lower latitudes, they tend to be uh, sedentary. 
if you the final one of course is the um the uh, australasian osprey which is actually just now regarded by some as a separate species the eastern osprey those birds again they, they tend to be sedentary so they basically are remaining around the nest site uh, year round but i think it's fair to say that you know the osprey is a, a really special bird when it comes to migration and i think because of the research that's been done over the last two decades our understanding of, of osprey migration is probably as good as many any species anywhere in the world and that is in no small part to the satellite tracking that's been done in the UK, among other places. And, and this talk is really going to focus specifically on the migration of ospreys from the UK down through Europe and then across the vast and desolate uh, Sahara all the way down to West Africa. But before we get into the specifics of ind individual birds' journeys, then it's, it's important to just... Um, think for a minute why birds actually migrate in the first place it might seem an obvious question to make but the key element of course is really the seasonality of resource availability if you breed at northern latitudes let's just say you breed in Finnish Lapland well clearly the the winters there are just far too cold for a, a specialist um, fish eating bird to remain for the year round so those birds have to go south likewise in the UK it's very it's very difficult to think that an osprey in Scotland could survive um, a Scottish winter. It may be in years to come that when a population becomes established on the south coast of England, there may be one or two birds that in time might overwinter. But generally, um, ospreys from the UK are going to go south and they're probably going to go to West Africa. And it really is the, the, the seasonal kind of resource availability that drives those movements. And it's not just ospreys, it's a, you know, a diverse array of migratory species that do the same thing. Um, and as I say, it's all to do with the diet. But of course, migration will take you to some fantastic places. I mean, the places that I described later in this talk, you can really see why an osprey is prepared to fly 3000 miles to take advantage of the, you know, the, the fish rich coast of West Africa. But the fact is that with that journey come some real hazards. Um, and you know those so the selective advantages of actually migrating are offset by the costs of migration and those those include various factors so uh, predation is one disease anthropogenic hazards um you may have seen this last week of the um, osprey that was seen shot in malta um, that's just one anthropogenic hazard there's all sorts of others such as um, wind turbines and so forth um, but then other factors so exhaustion um, food shortage and mortality that might be associated with weather and different wind conditions experienced en route and as you'll see later wind particularly is very influential on the first migration of young ospreys as they go south from the UK um, but lots more on that in a while. Um, and as you start to think about migration it's really important to consider the mechanics of the journey and how the birds actually do it. I mean we you know everybody knows about the incredible migration that Arctic terns do. Um, you know, right from the Arctic Circle, right down in some cases to Antarctica. Um, and then there are others that migrate in a very different way. And the key thing really is that birds essentially migrate by two contrasting flight methods. So um, flapping flight is obvious. It's obvious that when a bird flies, it's flapping its wings. Um, but there are some species and particularly smaller birds, passerines, but also um, other seabirds like Arctic terns, they migrate by flapping flight. They're relatively light um, and um, flapping flight is not too energetically costly. And that means that they can make long journeys um, by creating the power for the necessary lift and thrust entirely themselves by beating their wings. However, if you're a bigger bird, if you're a black stork, for example, as you see in this photo here, then, um, then it becomes more difficult because of course, flapping flight for a big bird like that is far more energetically costly. So those bigger species, stuff like storks, eagles, vultures, they've evolved to uh, utilize soaring gliding flight. So that's basically where um, birds with big broad wings are able to utilize thermal updrafts and also um, orographic lift, which is basically when you get horizontal winds that are deflected upwards by um, landscape features, by ridges, hillsides, and so forth. Um, they utilize that rising, rising air 
um, and they catch it and they, they increase their altitude. And once they get to the top of the thermal or where the orographic lift is, then they glide onwards. And that provides, it's that, that altitude that provides the required power for them to continue on their journey. And as you can really see, just by looking at those two photos, the ability of a given species to use these different types of uh, flight modes is really determined by their size and their morphology. So birds, larger birds with, with broad wings are much better able to utilize thermals. And that's really useful for them because flapping flight is just so much more energetically costly. And there are specific ways that we can measure the ability of a species to utilize thermal updrafts. Um, and one of them is wing loading. And wing loading is basically calculated by dividing the body mass of the bird by the wing surface area. And it's of particular importance in determining the ability of a, of a soaring gliding bird to, to actually exploit that um, uplift. And, you know, there are different species that are able to exploit that, with that lift in different ways. So species with a lower wing loading, so species like Montague's Harrier, for example, which has got a wing loading of 2.12, um, they're able to exploit weaker lift because they have a, a, a lower sinking speed. So basically it doesn't take as much lift to help them increase altitude because they're lighter um, and you know they're just they're smaller birds and so they're able to their wings are broad enough to utilize the lift to gain altitude however if you're a bigger species like a griffin vulture for example whose wing loading is 6.87 then you need stronger updrafts to gain altitude in the first place but once you get to the top of that thermal updraft then because you're heavy and you've got these big broad wings then basically you're able to fly or glide faster between the thermals. So all the time there are these kind of trade-offs and, and birds are adapting their migration according to you know, their own morphology. And the morphology of the different species then in turn influences actually where they go, how they get from A to B on migration. And this is a really you know, a quite a well-known um, detour that short-toed eagles make from from uh, Italy. Now, the thing with a short-toed eagle is that they they really don't want to make long sea crossings, and that because that's because they're a they're a heavy raptor, and you know that they want to avoid making or having to cross an ocean, which involves basically flying by flapping flight. You'll see in a while that some species like the osprey are able to exploit some lift over the ocean, but basically, if you're flying at sea, you have to make that crossing by flapping flight. So um, there was some research a few years ago by Agostini et al, um, which was published in 2015. And they basically showed that energy consumption during powered flight is a key determinant of the ability of raptors to cross large expanses of water. So if you're a heavy raptor and therefore flapping flight is much more energetically um, costly, you basically want to avoid having to do it. So the short-toed eagle has evolved this strategy where initially, in order to go south, it first has to go north. So it flies up through Italy um, to southern France and then follows the, the French and then the Spanish coast south to the Strait of Gibraltar, where the crossing is just 14 kilometres, as opposed to crossing the Mediterranean direct from um, Italy to North Africa. Now, other species don't have to make that detour. So both black kites and particularly ospreys are able to make much longer sea crossings because they're just better adapted to those long ocean flights. And there's much more on the ocean flights of ospreys in a, in a while. And if you look at this um, table, you can really start to understand why this is the case. So um, if you look at, uh, we mentioned griffin vultures earlier, if you look at the um, the power they require for, for for powered flight, it's 408 watts. Whereas if you go down to much lighter species, so uh, you know the Montague's Harrier, um, for example, then you know you're talking about uh, you know much a much lesser requirement. And if we talk specifically about the the three species that um, I've just mentioned, well, short-toed eagle, their uh, power requirements are 67.3. Which is, which is considerably higher than both Osprey, which is 37.9, and Black Kite, which is 31.6. So you can really see there that it's that 
the energetic requirements of powered flight that enable, because they're relatively low for both osprey and black kite, they can go across the sea, whereas short-toed eagle has to make that long detoured route where it can follow land and therefore can utilise thermal updrafts and migrate by soaring gliding flight. And that's why at certain places around the world, like the Strait of Gibraltar, you get these real bottlenecks where you get huge numbers of, of soaring birds on migration because they want to cross the sea at the shortest possible point. And it really does make for a most incredible spectacle. If you're ever fortunate enough to find yourself in one of these places in autumn, it's a really awe-inspiring place. I mean, I've seen huge numbers of birds flying across the, across the Mediterranean from Spain to North Africa, and it really is just one of the most memorable um, experiences of my of my life. Really, just you know, can't recommend it highly enough. Um, now, then, when it comes to migration, um, morphology is one thing that's really influential, but but the other element is is wind, and you can well imagine that if you're a migrating bird, then wind plays a hugely influential role in how you're able to undertake your journey. And what we see is that different, the ability to adjust to the wind is, is age dependent and, in, and also um, not just in the sense of whether you're kind of drifted by the wind or not, but in your kind of ability to understand whether you should allow yourself to be drifted by the wind or whether you should just continue um, try and compensate for it. So migrating birds, as they go, as they go south or north, depending on which journey they're on, um, they're able to respond to crosswinds, which are particularly important in three different ways. So they, they might drift with the wind, and this is particularly the case for juveniles. On their first migration with very little experience, if there are crosswinds, they will almost certainly drift in the direction of the wind. So if there's an easterly wind, they'll drift to the west um, and vice versa. However, older birds are able to, in some cases or often, compensate for the wind so in order to compensate for the wind if they want to go due south and they have and they and there's a strong easterly wind then they have to set themselves strikes um, slightly to the west to compensate for the for the for the wind um, now in some cases that leads to them overcompensating so they 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 set their track too far off course and then the wind the wind isn't strong enough to to blow them back in the in the kind of the path they want to go. So these are all kind of really key components to understanding the challenges that birds face on migration. And it's really interesting, actually, if you look at, there was a, a paper published a few years ago where they actually looked at the differing response of adult ospreys and adult marsh harriers to crosswinds. And what they found is that um, those two species actually modulate their response to crosswinds according to where they are on the journey. So you can imagine that if uh, an adult osprey, let's say it sets off from its wintering site, which might be in West Africa, perhaps somewhere on the Senegal coast, and it's going to Scotland. Well, in the early part of the journey, there's not much point compensating for crosswinds. You might as well allow yourself to be drifted by the wind, even if that means you get pushed further into the Sahara than you might wish, because it's too energetically costly at that stage in your journey to, to warrant you know, kind of maintaining the most direct path back to your breeding grounds. But as you get closer to either your nest or perhaps a midpoint on migration that you go to every year, which I'll, I'll come on to a bit later, then because you want to get to that one specific place, you have to compensate for the wind. So if the wind, if the wind is a, a really strong crosswind, you have to compensate because you want to navigate to a specific place. Uh, and that's what that's what both ospreys and marsh harriers do. So at the start of their migration, they'll allow themselves to be drifted by the winds. But in other points, then they will um, they will compensate um, in order to get to a specific location. For juveniles, it's a totally different story because in many cases they're migrating on their own. Certainly in the case with ospreys, they're migrating on a kind of predetermined direction, which again I'll come on to later. But they have no previous experience so that they're not able to compensate for win because to be honest they don't have the same sense of where they are on the journey compared to say an experienced adult so it's really fascinating to see how migratory species like ospreys like marsh harriers are really able to adapt their migration as they grow in experience and and begin to learn how to adapt their migration according to different conditions they face en route 
And one of the reasons that we know this is because of satellite tracking. And satellite tracking has really just increased our understanding so much in the last few years. And it's thanks to that satellite tracking that much of the um, data that I present in this talk is, is possible. And I think it's really important to state that much of the satellite tracking work that's been done in the UK has been undertaken by Roy Dennis. Roy's really pioneered the satellite tracking of raptors um, in the UK. And a few years ago, um, I was lucky enough to do my PhD on osprey migration, and actually used a lot of the data that Roy's collected over the years in Scotland as well as um, data we'd collected at Rutland Water when I was managing the uh, Rutland Osprey project. So it does provide just the most incredible insight into the birds' journeys. Now, this is the point where um, I remembered to press record when I was actually doing the um, live webinar. So I shall now switch to the, um, the recording and hope you enjoy the rest of it. It really is quite staggering, the detail with which um, we're able to collect this, this, this information. And that, of course, means that we don't just understand where the birds are going, but how they're getting there, how their altitude changes during migration. So, you know, um, over and above simply recording the location of the bird at a point in time, the transmitters create three dimensional details. So they, they log the bird's altitude as well. So you can see how altitude changes sometimes in the course of a matter of seconds or minutes. And that is really you know, just provides such a depth of detail to, to help us understand about osprey migration. And as I mentioned earlier, os uh, satellite tracking of ospreys um, in the UK was really pioneered by Roy Dennis. Um, and it came about really in the late 90s and early 2000s when um, I was first involved with the osprey translocation at Rutland Water. And I remember one year, um, one of the researchers who's likewise really pioneered the technique in Europe, Perti Sarola, came down from Finland and, and he and Roy fitted um, ospreys with satellite tags um, for the first time in the UK in 1999. They fitted some of the birds that had been translocated to Rutland Water with tags and, and Roy also fitted some to birds in, in northern Scotland. And the technology's evolved a lot since then, but that first, you know, those first tags that were used in 1999, you really started to you know, break new ground and help us understand the routes the birds were using. Um, and that information has just become more and more detailed over recent years. Um, and what it's done is it's really shown us how osprey migration evolves with age. So for, the, for a juvenile osprey leaving its nest for the first time, like any um, immature bird that's not migrated before, it's an incredibly demanding time probably the most hazardous period of their life so far. And we know that juvenile ospreys in migratory populations tend to stay in their nest site for something like four to six weeks after fledging. Uh, and during that period, that's a really key period because during that period, they're still reliant on their parents for fish and particularly the male. The male will stay with the young until, until the last of his offspring have, have migrated. And during that period, the key requirement for those young ospreys is to build up their strength and to eat as much fish as possible because most of those birds are not gonna learn to catch fish for themselves before they set off on migration. Most of them won't have caught a fish before they set off on migration, but their body condition at the start of the journey is incredibly important. So. Um, what we find is that some juvenile ospreys during the post-fledging period will, will wander up to perhaps 15, 20 kilometres from the nest. But some birds stay, you know, are very resolute. They stay very close to the nest. They don't venture far away. And they do that because they know that if they stay at the nest, they're more likely to get the fish from the, the, their father when he brings it in, particularly if they've got siblings and, and competition. And if they get, you know, if they really build up their strength and they, they get themselves into good condition, it greatly increases their chances of surviving that first very perilous migration south. And I think, you know, one of the really remarkable things about a bird like the osprey is that these young juvenile birds migrate on their own. So they're not like uh, species like, you know, some geese or storks that migrate in family groups or mixed age flocks. Um, young ospreys are basically going it alone. So you can't even say they navigate, because if you look at the, the um, definition of navigation in the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll get the process of activity of accurately ascertaining one's position um, 
and planning and following a route. Well, the Ospreys have not migrated before, so they're not navigating in the true sense of the word. What these young birds are doing is they're relaying, relying on an innate ability to migrate in the right direction, an instinctive ability to go, if you're an Osprey from the UK, southwest, and that takes you down towards West Africa. And basically, the, the way they do this is through a, an inherited program of, of direction and distance, which is called um, vector summation. And vector summation, uh, kind of to break it down, really means that the migration route is broken down into a series of flight steps, which you might call vectors. And the orientation of each of those flight steps is basically around a primary mean direction. So that's the direction the birds have inherited. So effectively, an osprey that is reared in a nest in Scotland, Wales, England, will have inherited a tendency to migrate southwest. So instinctively, they know to go southwest. And that's what they'll do. But the problem is, if you've not done that journey before, and if you're not skilled at um, kind of adapting to the wind, then you can very easily be influenced by external factors. So crosswinds, as I mentioned earlier, are a particular problem for young juvenile ospreys on their first flight south. And because of the UK's location in Western Europe, then easterly winds in particular pose a real threat, as you'll see in a minute. The other thing about the first migration is that the, bird, the young birds effectively are, to a certain extent, you know, at the will of the weather. And, and that means that their route can be very variable compared to adult ospreys, which, as we saw earlier, or I mentioned earlier, are able to compensate for things like crosswinds. But what we do know, and again, I'll cover this in more detail, is that the first migration is that is strongly influences the subsequent journeys that ospreys make in you know in in years to come and some ospreys might live into their late teens or early 20s and those birds are basically going to be using a route that they first learnt on their first migration they'll have refined it over subsequent journeys but essentially they're going the way that they found on that first flight south so there's a high although there is this instinctive and innate ability to migrate in the right direction there's a high degree of luck and chance that's involved and one of the reasons we know this now is because long term tracking of individual birds has been possible. So there are some specific individuals who um, have been tracked for a number of years, and it's particularly useful when that's been the case um, for, you know, say, um, juveniles, because, of course, you know, you can then start to look at how a juvenile has refined its migration over subsequent journeys and learned from mistakes and in some cases change course. And the best example we've got probably in the UK of this is a, is a bird that was tagged by Roy Dennis on the Rothy Mercus estate near Aviemore in Northern Scotland. And Rothy Mercus um, was actually um, ringed very late in 10th of August, 2009. So that's, that's you know, late fledging for a, for a young osprey. But as you will see, he completed a really fantastic migration and that that bird's tag continued to provide data until the winter of 2014 so basically it, it enabled us to follow its journey um, backwards and forwards between um, Scotland and Senegal for a number of years and that provided some fascinating information. So Rothy Merckx's first flight south, which was in autumn 2009, was a real classic example of one of the main hazards for young ospreys on their first migration from the UK. So he set off down through England and then began migrating southwest. And as he went southwest, what happened? Well, there were easterly winds and those easterly winds blew him out into the Bay of Biscay. Now, we know that the osprey's morphology allows it to make long sea crossings. So it's not like a griffon vulture or a short-toed eagle that doesn't want to make a long sea crossing. Adult ospreys will, um, by choice, fly direct from southwest England to the north coast of Spain on occasions. But of course, here we've got a bird that has not done the journey before. And as it went south, it was drifted further and further west by the wind. And what that meant is that it missed the north coast of Spain. And it actually continued flying um, constantly for 33 hours. So it's flying through the night. And we think that when it was off the coast of Portugal, it probably landed on a boat. And that enabled it to just recalibrate for a while, to rest, and then reorientate itself. But it was interesting that it only reorientated itself um, once dawn had broken the next day. 
and it seems likely that it probably only reorient, reorientated itself because it could actually see land. And when it could see land, that's when it knew that it had to get there. So it flew across to Portugal. And then after such an arduous journey, it was no surprise that it spent a month um, in a river valley in, in northern Portugal, really just recuperating from that incredibly um, demanding first flight across the Bay of Biscay. Now, after a month in Portugal, he continued south and eventually um, completed his first migration and went to the Juge National Park in northern Senegal, which is a fantastic place, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And the actual number of travelling days that it took Rothy Merkus to complete the journey was relatively short, just 13 days. But his overall duration of migration was 47 days because he spent um, over a month beside that in that river valley in, in northern Portugal. But, you know, a, a demanding first migration, but a successful first migration. And he's not the only one to have kind of experienced, you know, a long flight over the sea um, and the Atlantic, because this is another bird that Roy tagged in 2012, um, a bird called Stan. And this did the most incredible eight day migration to the Cape Verde Islands. But again, the reason the bird ended up in the Cape Verdes was because of easterly winds. So you can see there that, you know, it's done a pretty good job of migrating southwest. If it had just kind of, if it hadn't got blown out um, into kind of southwestern Portugal as it flew south through Iberia, it probably would have been okay. If it had flown down the east coast of Spain, then it probably would have just used a very sensible route around the western edge of the Sahara down to somewhere like Senegal. But because as this bird flew south through Iberia, there were easterly winds, it found itself on the southwest tip of Portugal. And then this is where kind of vector summation comes in. So at this point, this is a bird that doesn't now know it's in the wrong place. It knows it's got to migrate southwest. So it's not able to correct itself. It basically um, continues onwards on what it perceives to be the right track. And unfortunately, what that meant is that it had to do a 980 kilometre, 25 hour nonstop flight from southwest Portugal to Lanzarote in the Canary Islands. And then even once it was on the Canary Islands, it still wanted to go southwest. It still knew it had to go further. But if you go southwest from the Canary Islands, what happens? Well, you go out even further into the Atlantic. And the bird wasn't helped by the fact that the wind was still easterly. So of course it was still slowly drifting out further and further out to sea. And it went southwest from uh, Lanzarote, from Gran Canaria actually, um, and then had to fly 33 hours non-stop across the sea before reaching the Cape Verde Islands. So it did finally make land, but an incredible migration across the sea. And it then stayed on the Cape Verdes for, for a week. And, you know, Roy was very excited to see, you know, you know, would that bird remain there? Um, there is a sedentary population of ospreys that breeds on Cape Verde. So it's possible that population got established by vagrants like this that have been blown off course and then decided to stay there. But sadly, after a week, there were no further transmissions from, from Stan's um, radio. And so presumably that bird died, um, probably continued, uh, attempted to continue going south um, over the sea and well the next land isn't till brazil so it's no surprise that it that it didn't didn't survive so long sea crossings are a, a clear hazard for juveniles on their first migration another real hazard is the sahara so um you know for a fish eating bird clearly this is not somewhere you want to linger for any length of time but if you're flying from the uk um down to West Africa, then you have to cross the Sahara at some point. And as you'll see in a while, the adult birds use a very sensible route across the western edge of the desert. But juveniles, again, because they're so influenced by the winds on their migration, they often um, attempt much longer crossings of the Sahara. So whereas the adult birds go down through Morocco, Western Sahara, Mauritania, down towards Senegal and Gambia, um, this bird, which was actually one of the translocated birds from Rutland Water in 2000, did a route that's more, more typical of some juveniles where it's, it's made a much longer easterly crossing. So between the 9th of September and the 17th of September, when it finally reached a tributary of the River Niger, it was crossing the desert. But it made it and eventually it flew down into Guinea and then back up 
towards Senegal and it settled in Senegal during the early part of the winter. So it did make it, but that was a, a long and arduous journey over the desert. And we know that the Sahara is one of the chief causes of mortality for, for young ospreys on their first migration. So looking at the birds that um, Roy's tagged in Scotland and also we tagged at um, Rutland Water and looking at where deaths have occurred, um, we know that 11 birds definitely died on their first migration. This is out of 34. And four of those birds died in the Sahara. Another three died in the Atlantic Ocean by being blown out by easterly winds. And two died in the Atlas Mountains. So there you go. There are real demanding legs of the journey that were accounting for some of these inexperienced juvenile ospreys. Uh, and then the only other deaths occurred, one in Scotland, one in Spain. So you can see that there are these real hazards as the birds fly south for the first time. But many of them do make it. Um, and Rothy Mercus, when he got to uh, Senegal, spent the early part of the winter in the Juge National Park, which is a fantastic place. And I've been really lucky to visit there. I visited there in 2011. And I have to say, it's one of the most memorable places I've ever been. One of the reasons it's so important is just its sheer size. So it's 16,000 hectares, but it's not just its sheer size. It's the fact that it's one of the first major wetlands that migratory birds get to when they cross the Sahara. So many species are, are drawn there. And those species range from aquatic warblers as a real stronghold of aquatic warblers at Juge, uh, but also species like Gargany. And the, the sheer numbers of birds that you see is just one of the most awe-inspiring spectacles I've ever seen. This is, and I must say that the photos that I use in this talk are, are all from a, a friend, John Wright, who I've done a lot of these trips with. And John, a fantastic photographer, but also a fantastic photographer of, of ospreys in the landscape and seeing them in the kind of scenes that you see them in in the winter. And this is an osprey at Juge with a huge flock of whistling ducks in the background. Another one with you know, a mixed flock of wildfowl there, there's Gargany, there's Gadwall, all species that have migrated south from Europe. And at the time I was working at Rutland Water and I remember thinking that, you know, in a good, good year at Rutland Water, we might, in the autumn, we might get a group of five Gargany together. Well, on, on a single day at Grand Lac in Juge, we saw a flock of 5,000 Gargany. So it really kind of puts the importance of that place for migratory birds really into perspective. And it's an excellent place for ospreys. Um, we saw many ospreys from, uh, we saw one from the Lake District, but we saw others from Germany and France. And it's no surprise because if you're crossing the Sahara, you've not eaten for perhaps four or five days. This is exactly the kind of place you want to come across. Um, and Rothy Mercus remained at Juge for the early part of the winter, but then most young ospreys are very nomadic and they might settle somewhere good but there's just this urge to continue to explore and to you know to to look further afield um, and in some cases also because adult os adult ospreys return to the same wintering site every year which i'll come on to in a while and they will often chase juveniles away from the best places so juveniles have this kind of nomadic feel about them but also they're often chased away from the best places by by adults and and Rothy Mercus that winter um, eventually flew further south um, through Senegal through Gambia down to um, Guinea and Guinea-Bissau but then back up to Senegal and then spent several weeks at another fantastic wetland in Senegal another place I've been really privileged to visit which is the Sinsaloum Delta a huge area 180,000 hectares of mangrove and shallow intertidal water and if you come in in the plain to to Banjul in the Gambia you you get this fantastic view of the delta and you can see why if you're an osprey migrating to West Africa for the first time this is the kind of place you want to go and Going out in a boat into the delta, you immediately see and get a feeling for the number of ospreys that winter there. It's a, it's a really spectacular place. And I love this photo because I just really like how the ospreys are living alongside the human communities of, of West Africa all through the winter and mixing with a range of um, species. These are slender billed gulls that you can see um, flying above the osprey. But there are particular place in the, places in the Sinsaloum Delta that you get really high concentrations. And one of them is an island called Ile d'Oiseau, um, very well named. Um, and the first year we visited that site, we saw 
14 ospreys perched within about 200 meters of sand. So this is a, a long sandy island that you see in the mouth of the delta, and it's just surrounded by shallow water. And if you're an osprey, an adult osprey that's um, winter there year after year, it's such an easy life because the, the waters around the island are full of mullet and other species. And so fishing is just incredibly easy, particularly as the tide goes out and the water's even shallower. Species like mullet are very, very abundant and easy to catch. And for juveniles, you know, when they've completed that first migration, it's, you know, they're often not in very good condition. But in places like this where fish are easy to catch, it does give them the chance. If they're allowed to stay there by the adult birds, it does give them a chance to recuperate. Um, and just slightly diverting away for a minute, I've got particular fond memories of this, the uh, um, Sinsloom Delta, because a few years ago I was out, out there with a group from the Rutland Osprey Project. I used to, to manage the Osprey Project at Rutland, and um, that's John Wright in the, in the front of the boat. And if I, in fact, I think some of you who are listening to the talk tonight were in that same boat with me. And we'd gone out in this boat in the Delta one evening, and we saw an Osprey with a blue ring on its right leg. It's not a satellite tag bird, but an osprey with a blue ring on its right leg. And we knew that that was one from either England or Wales. It wasn't quite close enough to read the leg ring. So we thought, well, we're gonna have to go back. So we went back the next day. And we know that ospreys are pretty faithful to the same site. So we went back to the same spot and John was at the front of the boat with his camera and the bird was perched in the mangrove. So we slowly inched our way towards it, but it was quite nervous. And as we got a bit, closer it took to the air and we thought oh no the chance has gone but luckily it circled over the boat and John was able to fire off a few shots with his camera and got this photo from which we could identify the inscription the colour ring which was 32 which was actually a breeding male from from the Rutland water population it had fledged at the Manton Bay nest and you know that was a fantastic moment because that was the proverbial needle in a haystack we had found a Rutland bird in Senegal without the aid of a satellite tag. So that was that was really exciting. Um, and then a few years later, two years ago, we went back to that same spot and to show how faithful adult ospreys are to the same place, 32 was in exactly the same plot spot in the Sinsaloom Delta. So this is a bird that continues to, to come back to the Rutland area and was fantastic to see um, down there. Anyway, back to Rothy Mercus. Now, so Rothy Mercus did this kind of exploring all, all, all along the Senegal coast down towards Guinea and Guinea-Bissau and then back into Senegal. And one thing we know is that juvenile ospreys, when they get to Africa, they then stay there for 18 months. So whereas in their second cal in the spring of their second calendar year, um, birds will begin to, the adult birds will go north. The juveniles then have a bit of respite because the adults go, but they, they stay in West Africa. Um, and that really gives them gives them a chance to get settled in a particular location. And eventually the place that Rothy Mercus settled in was a tributary of the River Gambia. It was just in Senegal, but just north of the River Gambia. And it was notable that whereas he'd explored really widely over the winter, now he was actually settled in one particular location. And it's this process of exploration that basically enables ospreys to get established in one particular place for the winter. And then that's the place they then regard as their winter home and that's the place they go back to every subsequent year. Um, so Rothy Mercus made it and established a wintering site but we know that getting to West Africa doesn't guarantee that juvenile ospreys will then survive because when they arrive many of them are still in poor condition, many of them will still not be such proficient hunters as, as adults and so there's not a guarantee that they will survive their first winter or in fact second summer. In fact, 33% of the satellite tag juveniles that have survived their first migration have then subsequently died in West Africa on the wintering grounds. There are others that the um, satellite tags have failed and we don't know the outcome, others that have actually made it back, but 33% have definitely died on the wintering grounds. And there are all manner of threats. So one of them is just exhaustion from the migration and being in poor condition and being kept away from the best sites by established wintering adults but also there are predators so we know that juvenile ospreys will sit on the ground and they might be taken by crocodiles or jackals so you know they really have to have their wits about them and i included this photo because this is a 
a juvenile osprey that we translocated to Paul Harbour um, several years ago. And um, this bird made it to West Africa. And then there was a photograph taken of it at Kartong in the Gambia. And initially you think, great, you know, a photo of an osprey. But then you look a bit more closely and you see that it's missing virtually its entire tail. So obviously that bird had a very close escape, but then a few weeks later was actually found dead. So the chances are that one had been on the ground and then was grabbed by perhaps a jackal, maybe a feral dog, um, and probably eventually um, died of its injuries. So it just shows you that there are all manner of hazards lying in wait for these young birds during not only migration, but their first winter and then second summer. But after 18 months in the wintering grounds, whether that be West Africa or perhaps um, Spain or Portugal, the juvenile, the sub-adult ospreys as they are by then, will then go north. And what we then see is that when you look at the birds that we've tagged for a number of journeys, you really start to see how that first migration was influential. So the red line there is Rothy Mercus's spring migration in 2011. So this is the first time he's migrated north. Um, and you'll see that on his journey north, he didn't stop in the same place that he'd stopped off as he went south in Portugal, but he did stop off on the north coast of Spain. And it's also notable that he then crossed the Bay of Biscay and amazingly came ashore at almost exactly the same location in Devon from which he had departed in September 2009. So that was a point in the bird's migration where clearly it was it was making for as it as it as it flew north um, now that next summer or that summer once it was back in scotland these these young ospreys are basically learning where there might be future breeding opportunities so rothy mercus ranged over a huge area went all the way up to orkney on one day and then spent a lot of time in the scottish borders in cumbria um, and also in other areas went back to his natal site at uh, near Aviemore, but also spent time in Perthshire. So he basically ranged around virtually the whole of Scotland um, and then came south. But it was really interesting to see what he did when he went south because he'd had two very long flights over the Bay of Biscay. So even that flight north, even without the fact that he hadn't been blown out to sea as he had on his southward migration, he was still in the air nonstop for 28 hours and 830 kilometres. So it was still a very demanding journey. So when he went south, he followed the Atlantic coast of France. So, you know, there's a bird that's learnt it wants to avoid a long sea crossing. However, it also knows that it wants to get back to that estuary in Galicia that it spent nine days at on spring migration. So what do you do? Well, you have to do a dog leg migration. It's a bit like a short toed eagle. So, you know, clearly Rothy Mercus didn't want to fly across the sea. So instead, used this much longer detour route around the northern, the Atlantic coast of France, the north coast of Spain, to get back to that estuary. And what we're seeing here is basically the, the establishment of a what you might call an intermediate goal area on migration. So this is a place that that bird will now go through on every subsequent migration. So that estuary in Galicia has now become an integral part of that bird's migration. So a place that it learned on one of its first journeys has now become a place it visits on every subsequent migration in between. And the route between those kind of intermediate areas will vary with wind, but they will basically navigate to that spot on each journey. So really interesting to see that. Um, then, as Rothy Mercus then flew south through Portugal, again, used a very similar route to his first autumn migration and again, flew out across the Atlantic, again, had trouble with strong easterly winds but here you can see how experience is starting to tell because this bird Rothy Mercus was clearly able to real able to realize that he was being blown off course was able to compensate for the easterly winds and get back to the African coast if he'd been a juvenile on his first migration he probably would have been blown out to sea and died but he realized was able to compensate for those crosswinds and made it back to land and then went back to exactly the same place, that tributary of the River Gambia. And his winter range that year was just 0.5 kilometers squared. So, you know, from that previous first winter in Africa where, you know, he explored over a huge area, now he's just going back to one specific location. 
And that next winter, I was actually able down again in West Africa with a, with a group of volunteers from the Osprey Project at Rutland. And we decided it'd be great to go and actually see Rothy Mercus at his wintering site. So we, we, we took our minibus um, quite severely um, off road and drove through a village, um, which, you know, typical Senegalese village. I really wonder what the residents made of us as we, as we went through, but we drove through the village and we found, you know, using GPS, the exact location that we were, we were looking for. And after a bit of searching, you know, you'd think it'd be easy to find them. It wasn't, but we actually did see Rothy Mercus. And interestingly, even at this stage, we saw him, as you can see in this video, being chased by a, by another wintering osprey. So even in his, um second stint in africa he was still being chased by by rival birds so it just shows you that they still have a hard time you know there's still kind of territorial battles that that ensue when they're even when they're more of an established adult bird but that was a really really fantastic moment you know you go from looking at um points on google earth you know red circles on google earth showing the gps fixes to actually seeing the bird um in location was just fantastic and um a few years ago um joanna daly who i think is also um on on the um webinar tonight she went back to that location actually saw rothy mercus still i think this was probably three four years ago now but he was still going back to exactly the same place even though now the transmitter had stopped working so here was a bird who you know enabled us to understand so much more about osprey migration so um you know just look at this um so let's firstly you know there's a few th few few key points to um come back to joanna i see you've raised your hand i'll i'll come back to you at the end um firstly um an unusual dog leg uh migration so you can see there that um you know he he learned from experience from that first difficult migration um across the bay of biscay to to avoid a long flight across the sea but still wanted to go back to glythia um that area in glythia became a goal area on his migration you can see there how on every subsequent journey the bird went back to that same estuary and actually you know navigated back to that estuary and that comes back to this point about how adult ospreys in certain at different points in their journey will compensate for crosswinds. So Rothy Mercus in this case was definitely navigating back to that intermediate spot on his journey. Um, and also then that after those winter wanderings, he, he, he got himself established um, back in, you know, a, a really excellent wintering site um, and continued to return there um, every subsequent winter. Um, the other, uh, interesting thing is the difference between just subtle differences between spring and autumn migration so in spring spring migration as we'll come into it in onto in a minute um ospreys often face headwinds on their on their migration north and when they're facing headwinds they're much more reluctant to cross the open sea um so it's perhaps no coincidence that in spring rothy mercus used a, a shorter crossing across the strait of gibraltar whereas in the autumn when there's more likely to be tailwinds um can make longer crossings across the Atlantic. Um, and then again, yeah, those three uh, spring crossings through Prawl Point in, in Devon, um, which was really quite extraordinary. So that's juveniles. That shows you just how they start to learn from experience over subsequent journeys. But, but what about adults? What about adult birds that really know what they're doing? So adult ospreys, as we've seen, go back to the same established wintering site every year. So this is where navigation really comes in. So these birds truly are navigating to a place that they know and a place that they've learned. So it's not just instinct now, they're actually going to somewhere with purpose. Um, and the time of departure varies between the sexes. So females, some females leave virtually as soon as they're young and fledged. You know, their job is basically over, they can go. They'll often have a stopover um, not that far south from their nest where they can build up their strength um, before continuing migration, but they'll often leave very early. Whereas the males, they remain until the last, or normally re remain until the last of their offspring have departed, and then they go south. So it's very interesting to see, you know, 
real kind of differences between the sexes. Of course, there are exceptions. The Manton Bay pair, for example, in uh, at Rutland Water, the male and female often stay together right into early September, even when the young, even when the young have gone. So there are different individual traits, but as a general rule, females go quite soon after the young are fledged, whereas males wait until the last of their offspring have, have departed. And our satellite tracking has really shown that most of them will go to West Africa. There are an increasing number of, of ospreys now from the UK that winter in Spain and Portugal. And I should say that colour ringing, um, you know, also provides a huge amount of information on where birds are spending the winter. And we're now getting a you know, much greater number of colouring sightings from both Portugal and southern Spain during the winter. But the vast majority of the population will continue south. And Senegal tends to be the favoured country, but also Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Guinea uh, some stay in Mauritania, others go further south. So there's one bird from Rutland Water that went to the Ivory Coast and others go as far south as places like Ghana. So, you know, there's a broad range of areas where the birds may end up. And really, that is all down to where they ended up as juveniles, where they, how far south they went on their wanderings and where they established that, that future wintering site. Now, when it comes to the, the kind of daily flights of, of ospreys on migration, you know, it's interesting to look at the distances adults do travel each day it tends to be in the region of about 200 to 300 kilometers per day but it does vary according to season um, and also where they are on the journey so the longest daily distances tend to be in africa uh, during the autumn so they might average over 300 kilometers per day when they're trying to get across the sahara as quickly as possible and some of the slowest daily um, or the shortest daily distances are actually in spring in Europe and that's because as they fly north through Europe in the spring often weather conditions are really against them you know so they might face headwinds there might be days with rain that delay them um, or perhaps it just rains for an afternoon and they have to stop or there are very strong winds you know a range of different factors in the spring the birds are desperate to get back to their nest site to reclaim their nest site from any rivals but of course they have to be careful not to exert themselves too much and we know that some adult birds do die on the spring migration simply by trying to battle the elements and, and dying of exhaustion as a result. So, you know, it's a, it's a trade-off really between getting back to your nest site but not taking undue risks on migration. And wind, condi wind conditions, as you would expect, are incredibly influential. So we know that in autumn, conditions tend to be more benign. You tend to get more tailwinds and of course that enables the birds to fly further per day. Um, and it's very interesting that some of the adult birds really learn to take advantage of the most optimum migration conditions. And this is most evident if you look at the flights of, of adult, adult male ospreys. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, adult males normally remain at their nest site until the last of their offspring have, have departed. Um, and that can mean that they can actually leave quite late. They can leave in sort of mid to even late September. Um, but what they'll then do is that when they know they can go, they'll sometimes wait a few more days, they'll wait till the optimum conditions and then they'll go. And the best example of this is um, Blue XD, which is a breeding male from Straths Bay in northern Scotland. Again, a bird that, that Roy satellite tagged. And you can see there that after leaving comparatively late on the 10th of September, it absolutely made up for lost time. It flew um, non-stop for 36 hours for two and a half, 2,100, two, sorry, 2,001 kilometers to extra Madeira in, in central Spain. Um, and, you know, this isn't an, an, a juvenile osprey that's been blown out to sea that has to keep going because otherwise it's, it's going to drown at sea. This is a bird that's actually making a, a, a definite decision, a concerted effort to maximize really favorable conditions. It had a tailwind. Um, and it flew through the night when there was a full moon. So conditions were absolutely perfect. And that enabled it, it to have this fantastic start to its journey. And what we see is that some adult birds um, during autumn migration will make long flights across the Bay of Biscay. So whereas juveniles often do it just purely by chance because they've been blown there, some adult birds actually make a, concert, a, a definite decision to go across the sea. And they do that when the tailwind favours it. So if you get a um, northeasterly wind as the birds go south through France, they'll go across the Bay of Biscay. If the wind was, say, more northwesterly, then they just stay on the coast. So they learn to adapt 
their flight according to the direction of the wind. Um, and there have been some very long flights across the um, across the Bay of Biscay, longest about th 1,365 kilometres. So, you know, these are significant flights across the sea. Um, but as I say, all those autumn flights are always undertaken when there's a northeasterly tailwind. So the, the adult birds know it's the best optimum conditions to do it. In the spring, when you get a predominance of northwesterly winds, um, then spring crossings of the Bay of Biscay are very rare. Um, you can see there in the in the migrations I analysed for my PhD thesis, there were just four. And that's because the conditions really don't favour a long and demanding crossing of the sea. So meteorological conditions definitely factor, definitely influence how far ospreys fly each day and therefore how long it takes them to get to their wintering sites. But there is definitely th this thing where later departing birds make up for lost time. And we think they do that because they want to get back, just like they want to get back to their nest site in the spring, they also want to get back to their um, established wintering site and return to their favoured spot in the beach. This is a, a satellite tag female from Rutland Water that again John photographed in Senegal and she sits on that exact spot every single winter in West Africa. She knows that's a safe place to go and what she doesn't want is some rival juvenile osprey to be taking her spot on the beach so she wants to get back to that spot because she knows that's a safe place to spend the winter so just like spring migration when they want to get back to their nest sites there's also urgency to get back to their wintering locations um, now um, in terms of daily distances adults and juveniles tend to be pretty similar so um, it tends to be somewhere in the region of 200 to 300 um, kilometers but there are exceptions and those exceptions tend to be when um, juveniles are forced to make these really long flights over the sea but if you look at the differences between adults and juveniles there, there are some obvious differences and one of them is that juveniles tend to incorporate more stopover days on their migration and those stopover days might be because they just encamp they just come across by chance somewhere where fishing's really good so they can refine their fishing technique they can build up strength before continuing their journey. The adult birds that have done the, done the journey many times before don't need to do that. So they, so they just kind of often just motor on south. Um, the other interesting thing that I, I found when I was looking at my PhD uh, research was that juveniles that spent longer at their nest in Scotland actually then had fewer stopover days. So they were probably leaving in better condition, which enabled them to then complete their migration faster. But for juveniles, um, rather than getting to the wintering grounds as quick as possible, it's better to be careful to get there in good condition, because if you get there in good condition, you've probably got a better chance of holding your own against some of these um, more experienced adults. Now, um, I realise we're at eight o'clock. I'm not going to speak for too much longer, but I just want to tell you a bit more about, um, finally, just how the ospreys actually um, migrate, because the, the most recent... Um, uh, the most recent uh, GSM tags that, that we've been able to use collect the most incredibly high resolution data um, and that enables us to log um, location, altitude, speed and orientation of migrating ospreys as regularly as once every minute. So suddenly you get an incredibly detailed insight, not just into how, into where the birds are going, but actually how they migrate. So you can start to see their use of thermal updrafts. And for my thesis, I actually looked at the um, migrations of three adult birds from Scotland with GSM tags. And what I was able to determine from um, the data was that when they're over land, the birds, as you would expect, are generally flying by soaring and gliding. So they're, they're exploiting thermal updrafts, they're exploiting, exploiting orographic lift, um, and that's really minimising their energy expenditure. And we know that because um, we've got this incredibly detailed um, data. So these are cross sections of the same point in time over Portugal. And, and you can see how um, at 12.01, if you look at the top left-hand um, image, the bird was flying at an altitude of 513 meters. Well, over the course of the next six minutes, it then circled up in a the thermal and it got up to 864 meters at 12.07 and then look down at the next, at the image below, and you can see there that it got to the top of the thermal and then glided forward. So it's not made any on onward progress while it's circling the thermal, but once it gets to the top of the thermal, opens its wings and glides forward. 
Likewise, when they're over the Sahara, you tend to think that the Sahara is this incredibly demanding place for ospreys, and it is. But for adult birds with the benefit of experience, then, you know, they are able to negotiate it and they basically use environmental conditions to their favour. So when they're migrating across the Sahara, they wait until the time of the day when thermal updrafts start rising and then they take advantage of it. So you can see here again that in this example, this bird, the altitude has gone on, gone from 308 metres at 1115 up to 969 metres um, just seven minutes later. So it's circled up in a thermal and then it gets to the top of the thermal and glides onwards. And the best way to illustrate that is this video, which shows you a cross section of a bird as it's going across the desert. And you can really clearly see here that it's not, this bird is not using flapping flight. It's just circling up in thermals and then gliding forward. So this is the kind of information that the satellite tracking enables us to, um, to, to glean from the data. And it really is fantastic to see. Now, interestingly, you would think that um, as they go across the sea, their flight has to be very different. And that is the case. So when they're going across the sea, you generally don't have any kind of updrafts. So the birds have to migrate by flapping flight. And the advantage the osprey has compared to, say, something like a griffon vulture is that flapping flight for an osprey, because of their morphology, is not so demanding. So they can make these long flights across the sea. Um, but what we're able to see with these GSM transmitters is that on occasion, in autumn, when sea surface temperatures are, uh, are warmer, you can actually get some weak thermals over the sea. And that enables ospreys to exploit lift just as they do over land. So the lift is not as strong um, as it is, say, over the Sahara Desert, um, but it is sufficient to enable the osprey to gain altitude and then glide forward. So it's saving it valuable energy even over the sea. Um, and there was some research done by um, Flavio Monti and colleagues in the Mediterranean that showed something very similar in the Mediterranean. So this is one of the adaptations, the ability of the osprey to exploit weak thermal updrafts to even manage to, to achieve soaring gliding flight over the sea. So it shows you how highly adapted to migration this, this species really is. Um, now, when it comes to adult birds, their survival during migration is normally very high. So about 90% of Adult osprey survive from year to year uh, and return to their nest each spring. Some live right into their 20s. So, you know, they have a very long life and they cover huge distances on migration. But of course, on occasion, uh, things go wrong. And a good example is this bird, 0998, which was a bird that was translocated to Rutland Water by Roy in 1998. Um, and in 2012, it left Rutland Water having bred successfully. Um, and raised two chicks and it set off um, across the Bay of Biscay, migrated south through um, Spain, across the Strait of Gibraltar and on the 12th of September reached a ridge in the northern edge of the Sahara. And you could see there from the satellite data that it was roosting on that ridge one night. Well that's the sort of place an osprey will stay for a night but probably not for any longer. But sadly, when the next update came in three days later, we found that the bird was still in the same location. So at that point, you know, either the bird has died or the transmitter's fallen off. But it's an incredibly remote place. How are you going to know? Well, I emailed a few contacts and amazingly, within a few days, this guy, Farid Lacroix, offered to actually go and look for the bird on the edge of the Sahara. And he drove south from his home in Agadir and trekked up basically drove as far as he could into the desert until you know his vehicle couldn't get any further and then he had his satellite phone he had a load of water and a rucksack and trudged up the hill where we or the ridge where we were getting the data and he actually located the remains of 09 which is quite incredible so less than a week after me putting out an appeal to locate this osprey farid had actually found it and sent us photos so just really really fantastic and it was very sad but for me it kind of demonstrated how the migration of ospreys can really um, bring people together anyway um going back to adult ospreys and i am now on the final stretch you might well be pleased to know um adult ospreys do have a very easy life in winter because they go back to somewhere they know um it's probably somewhere where the fishing is very easy 
um, and they don't have to do very much. They've got no dependent offspring, so they catch perhaps one or two fish a day, um, and the rest of the time they just sit around on a favoured perch. Um, and a good example is this particular osprey, which is a German bird, F93, which is now 21 years old. And I've seen her on every trip I've made to Gambia since 2011. And I think I've been eight times now. Um, so, you know, this is a bird that I've seen in exactly the same location every winter. Um, and I know colleagues who go out, um, likewise see her regularly, Chris Wood being a, a good example. I know Chris is on this, um, is, is probably watching. So. Um, yeah, this is a bird that go, you know, has got a regular wintering site, knows where to go, and that's it. Um, but there are threats, and if you walk along beaches in West Africa, sadly, you see the tar of humanity. You see discarded fishing nets, you see plastic, and those anthropogenic um, hazards are a risk to even adult ospreys. And so on one of my trips, one of the first trips that we made to West Africa, I decided that it would be really helpful to try and use the osprey as a kind of flagship species to raise awareness, raise environmental awareness of some of the threats that migratory birds face, because it's not just ospreys, you know, terns and, and other shorebirds, are, you know, waders are, are basically living in the same areas and, and face the same threats. Um, and there's no better example than Tangi Beach. This is Tangi Beach, which is looking north, um, looking north at Tangi Beach, where you think, you know, really beautiful kind of typical West African beach. If you turn around from that exact location and look south, you see a beach, a very different beach, a beach full of people, people buying and selling fish, and you see ospreys just off shore. So you really see how the lives of ospreys in West Africa are very closely associated with people. And through the bird guide who was leading that, that trip that we went on, um, JJ, we set up a pilot education project in West Africa, basically where JJ, um, we raised some money for JJ to go into schools um, and teach the students about um, migratory birds and the need to protect them. Um, and JJ did a fantastic job. Um, uh, he took the kids out on field trips. And what we found is that um, through kind of the, you know, we devised a whole load of educational resources like a a book for children um, and we set up osprey clubs in the schools um, and even linked schools in West Africa with schools in in the UK we started to see that the conservation message really got across and this really kind of was brought home to me um, when I saw this photo of um, the football team in Tangi who called themselves Os Osprey FC um, with a nice little play on words there of do not shoot the osprey so it really showed that through the work of JJ who's a kind of really inspirational character the conservation message was starting to get across and what was really pleasing is that some of the schools then took it upon themselves to try and make a difference so they organized beach cleans and some of the students really started to take an active in an active interest in 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 nature in birds and potentially you know maybe the prospect of of a career in in that in that environmental sector so we arranged for opportunities for them to go out with JJ and to you know kind of hone their field skills and it really got me thinking that maybe we could do something to help them and potentially to set up a you know to help them get established in in their careers so a few years ago I set up the Osprey Leadership Foundation and basically the foundation is there to continue that environmental education work in in Gambian schools to continue to hopefully inspire young people in Gambia about the you know the natural world and the the amazing journey that birds like ospreys make and the need to protect habitats for some of those species um, but also then to help some of the ones who really show an interest and in an aptitude to potentially you know take that turn that interest into potentially a career um, and likewise, um, in the UK, um, we also um, felt there was a need to hopefully try and support young people in the early stages of their career. So the foundation basically works in, in different ways. So we do these um, uh, educational field visits for schools in the Gambia to just teach them, inspire them about nature. Um, and then we have something called the Osprey Leadership Academy, where we um, have more kind of bespoke training for um, young conservationists, both in, in West Africa and also the UK. And then some of the individuals from those programs then go to what we call the Osprey uh, Conservation, the Evolving Conservation Leaders Program, where we're offering more um, bespoke for support for people who we think have, have got real potential. Um, 
hopefully one of two of them are, are listening tonight. Um, but, you know, that's, yeah, and that's really kind of come about really because of the migration of the osprey and because I feel that this is a bird that can really inspire people um, about the natural world. And, you know, I think there's a real, there is a real case for using birds like the, the osprey as a flagship species that can really kind of promote environmental awareness and raise um, um, kind of interest in, in the protection of nature. So that's what we're doing. And there are certain young people in the Gambia, people like Dembo Jatta and Nafi Saar, who I think are the real conservation stars of the future, who we're doing our best to support. Um, and finally, um, I just wanted to finish because um, on one of our last trips to um, Gambia, we were out there with, uh, there's Dembo in the photo. He was um, helping our group to see various species at Kartong. And one of the last species we saw that day was an osprey. And this osprey, it turned out, had a, had a yellow ring on the right leg and we looked um, we got the inscription on the ring and I reported the details and we found out that it was a bird that was ringed as a nestling in Finland on the 18th of July um, 2018 and it had done this amazing migration of 6,474 kilometers from its nest site so that's the direct line of sight um, direct flight line presumably the bird had flown much further so to me, that really brought home how, you know, this incredible migratory bird links people um, thousands of kilometres and, and miles apart. Anyway, I've spoken for longer than I, I said I would, um, but um, I hope you've enjoyed the talk. I can see that there are um, a few questions. So I'm going to, um, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and I'm going to um have a look at the q a and i can see some questions there so i'll just go through them in order um, um so the first one um pete asks why do ospreys need to migrate when they have a great supply of high calorie food in their winter quarters why risk their difficult migrations well that's a great question you know why if you've got to west africa and you're in these really kind of fish rich areas why would you want to go any further? Well, I think the fact is that um, ospreys, you know, are programmed to return to the area that they fledged in. Male ospreys in particular are really sight faithful and go back to the same places, um, you know, go back often to their natal, very close to their natal site to breed. Um, and there are advantages to flying north because, of course, as you fly north, um, the day length increases during the, during the, breeding, during the breeding season. So, um, a male osprey that's got three chicks in a nest um, actually has, you know, quite a demanding job over the summer. And we see um, at nests that breeding males can be out foraging in the height of summer at sort of 4.35 in the morning and still at 10 o'clock at night. So that added day length that you get by flying further north um, is a real benefit for males. But I think the main factor is that this is, this is kind of how they've evolved. They've evolved to move south because, because the, you know the climate in the north doesn't allow them to stay there for the winter but then they want to return to those places to breed um there is also the case that in in west africa there are competing species so african fish eagles for example um and while you know they're not a threat to to juveniles perhaps they may be more competition for you know breeding birds in the in the breeding season um so that um that was that question from Pete. Next one is Alan um, asks roughly how many ospreys are tagged? Well, um, satellite tagging ospreys is, is expensive. Um, the price has come down in recent years. It was often, you know, kind of two and a half, three thousand pounds. It's now more like um, something like probably a thousand pounds for an, an Ornitella tag and their transmitters we now use, which are just fantastic. Um, but the price really prohibits the numbers you can you can tag so it's a relatively small proportion um but you know those those that small proportion still gives you a really i think uh, probably a representative sample of you know what the wider population um is doing um jim asks um do um land-based observation confirm the accuracy of the satellite positions absolutely um if you if you look at a, a breeding male or a female um that's gone back and is breeding on a on a regular used nest site, you'll see that the the GPS fixes are absolutely bang on for the nest. So you know there's the the accuracy is to within a few meters. Um, um, Caroline, how do you tell that they died rather than the tag failing? Well, that's a good question. Um, 
quite often it's because we've been able to find people to actually go and recover the bodies. So just like 09 um, in the Atlas Mountains, we're able to find someone. Likewise, there have been people who have helped in West Africa. So quite often we're actually able to locate the birds that have died. And that's normally because when, when, the, um, when a bird's died, what tends to happen is that the transmitter continues to transmit um, from the same location. So you, you, you probably know that it's either dropped off or the bird has died and um, they tend not to fall off at, it, at that early stage. So invariably it means the bird has died and someone can go and look. Um, if, the, if the transmitters failed, then it tends to just happen very suddenly. So in that case, you can't rule out that they've not um, been killed in some way, um, but equally it could just be that the transmitter has failed. There are other factors like um, there are voltmeters on the transmitters that show you the battery voltage in fact, and things like that. So some of those kind of technical details can show if there's a problem leading up to them when you lose transmission. So there's ways and means of, you know, determining um, what's happened. Um, Caroline, um, sorry, I've missed one off. Red 07 was absent for five years. Any thoughts on where he spent the time? Um, well, it's interesting. There are some birds that, you know, that, that, that do disappear. Um, and when they disappear for that time, it probably means that they're breeding at, you know, some, some location. There was one, I think probably the bird you're, you might be referring to is a, um, is a translocated bird at Rutland Water um, that, um, that basically um, didn't turn up to, it was five years old. I'm not sure if that's the one you're referring to, um, but that bird um, wasn't normally juvenile or sub-adult birds are seen back as a two-year-olds or three-year-olds. So that bird didn't come back for five years. So um, we're not sure, but um, young young ospreys, as you'll see from, seen from Rothy Merkus's wanderings in Scotland, they wander over a huge area when they first come back. So it could be that that bird just um, was wandering around and just settled at its natal site a bit later. Um, Caroline asks, is there any evidence that birds that don't migrate as far from the UK arrive back earlier in the spring than those which go further? That's a really good question, Caroline. And I think you're probably right, um, but it's actually, there's not that big a sample size to be sure. So um, yes, um, there are birds that, you know, probably, you know, the, the earliest arriving birds probably do just winter in, uh, Iberia and so that gives them a, a much greater advantage but I'm not sure we've, we've probably got enough evidence to say that's definitely the case but I think you're almost certainly correct. Um, someone else asked which estuary in Galicia does Rothy Merca stop at? I was hoping no one would ask me that because I've forgotten so I can't tell you but um, if you um, email me um, if you email tim at ospreylf.org or tim at roydennis.org I will tell you the answer. So yeah, just get in touch with me afterwards. Um, then there's a question, um, a question related to Sahara crossings. I've observed GPS data from six adults and four juveniles over up to four years for some individuals. The adults would sometimes cross Sahara, the Sahara quite far inland, all still Western Sahara though. Do these During these crossings, they stopped each night. And I noticed that these stops would often we're often at what looked like dried up river basins or lakes. Of course, this has to do with the time of the satellite pictures are taken. So my question is, do you know if the southern migration lines up with a kind of rain, rainy season in the Western Sahara? Yeah, that's that's something that um, that I've also wondered myself. Um, I think probably there are um, cases where the birds do come across um, uh, water in the Sahara, but um, it's, it's, it's impossible really to tell from the, the satellite data. But I think what we do know is that there are certain geographical features that the birds do follow on migration. So there are, um, in particular, there's a, a series of ridges that run southwest along the northern edge of the Sahara. I mean, if you look at the satellite tracks of birds from the UK, they regularly follow that ridge as they go south. And so there's no doubt that certain geographical features really um, are helpful for adult birds to aid their navigation, um, particularly once they've done several journeys and they recognise certain features of the, um, of the landscape. So probably doesn't answer the question properly, but it's one that I'd, I'd like to like answer myself. Um, 
Uh, Jim asks, how do you get the job of Tim's bag carrier? Well, um, I couldn't possibly say um, online, so I'm not going to answer that. Um, Valerie Weber, um, any idea what would make Osprey stay in Portugal and Spain? Scottish ones do, and also a Rutland one. Ah, good question, Valerie. I think it really just comes back to the fact that um, the, you know, some juveniles end up there um, and they find somewhere where they're catching fish really easily. And perhaps they just, they don't then have any incentive to go any further south. Um, I think it really just comes down to chance. If they, if they chance upon somewhere that's, you know, got a good supply of fish, then perhaps there's no need to go any further. So I think, you know, like the first migration really is, a lot of it is just down to chance. But there is definitely um, something in the fact that an increasing number of birds are wintering in Iberia. So there is also the possibility that adults that do that may then, you know, there may be some kind of genetic factor involved and perhaps, you know, some birds um, are more likely to stop in Iberia if their parents do. I think that's something that, you know, it's just a theory, but it, it, it's possible. So, um, you know, one for future studies to look at, I guess. Um, is there a difference, Catherine and Stephen ask, is there a difference between um, breeding success between migrating and non-migrating birds? Um, not really, interestingly. Um, you know, if you look at the productivity of breeding pairs, um, in the UK compared to say the Cape Verde Islands or the Mediterranean where some, some birds don't migrate, um, productivity is pretty similar. So I think the fact is that, um, you know, ospreys, adult ospreys are incredibly resolute things. They're very strong. And although on occasion they'll have a difficult spring migration and that may then hamper them. And, and in some cases they may arrive very late and they might lose their nest to a, to a rival. Um, generally it doesn't, have you know kind of effects at the, at the population level um the only effects that might come at the population level is if you have a year where there's a lot of mortality on migration so for example last spring um a lot of experienced adult birds didn't return and that was probably because of easterly winds that pushed them out into the sea um so you know that's that that does have an effect sometimes um and mortality among migratory populations in, is inevitably higher um, but generally, when it comes to breeding success, there doesn't seem to be um, much difference. Um, uh, another question, do ospreys pair for life? Um, yes, they generally do. So um, they establish, an, you know, they, they return as two year olds for the first time and they typically breed at perhaps anywhere between three and six years for the first time. And once they've established, once they've got a mate, um, they will then return to that same nest site and same mate every year. Um, but of course, by that stage, they've also got an established wintering site. So male and female osprey that breed together won't actually see each other at all during the winter. And then they're just um, reunited in the spring. Um, next one. Um, oh, good question. Rod asked me, um, do you, did you manage to figure out what 09 died of? Um, yes, I probably should have said. I don't know why I didn't. Um, we think that he was probably predated by a mammalian predator. Um, so the remains of the, the feathers that were there were, it was inconclusive, but we think that probably what happened is that he was roosting um, on that ridge and the data showed that the bird was alive till about, I think about 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, so probably just as it was starting to get light and some predators were active, um, probably the bird was just grabbed, um, just like we sometimes see um, ospreys in West Africa on the ground being, being taken by jackals or feral dogs. Um, it was probably something similar. It could have been a, maybe a fox. Um, we're not sure, but um, yeah, sadly, um, some sort of mammalian predator um, did for 09, which was a, a real shame but just shows you even an, you know, an experienced adult bird was still at risk of, of, of predation. Um, the next Mary asks, lots of information has been gathered from the satellite tags. Do you feel there is still more to find out? And if so, do you know what percentage of birds will be tagged in the future? Um, yeah, um, Mary, uh, it's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, we do know an incredibly an incredible amount about ospreys now as hopefully has come across in this talk um i think 
what's possible now is because the the the, um, the data is such high resolution that provides you know additional information that we've not been able to um, gather in the past so I think the very fact that the transmitters are now able to collect even higher quality data means it's probably worth you know continuing to tag some birds um, and I think the other thing is that it does provide really useful information on the movements of sub, sub adult birds when they first come back and breeding males when they're fishing you know their their use of different fishing sites so I think there is still a place to satellite tag tag ospreys but I would still say it's probably only a very small percentage that will that will be um, tagged. Um, Mary also asked, will the presentation be available on YouTube? Um, yes, it will be at some point. Unfortunately, the first part didn't record for some reason, but I think it got me after about 10 minutes. So um, yeah, we'll, I'll post it on YouTube at um, some point. Um, how do you fit the transmitters um, is a good question. Um, well, basically they, they fit on the birds almost like a backpack. So there's a Teflon harness. Um, if you imagine the transmitter sits on the bird's back, and then there are Teflon ribbons that go through the transmitter. There are four straps that are then sewn um, kind of on the bird's breast, not onto the bird, but they're just sewn together. So it fits onto the bird like a backpack. Um, and the idea is that there's then, they're sewn with cotton, but there's a weak point so that at some point um, in the future, that transmitter is able to, to drop off. And there have been cases where, you know, birds that have been tagged in the past, they come back one year and they've lost their tag. And actually that's happened with, um, 3005, which is one of the birds um, that I talked about in my um, in my talk, the bird that winters on the coast of Senegal. She came back one year, her tag wasn't functioning, and in fact, it wasn't even um, attached to her. So it, it, it did drop off just as we hoped. Um, why do ospreys not migrate as family groups? It sounds like that strategy would be far less risky. Well, yeah, it would, Eve. I completely agree. Um, I guess it's a strategy that the species has evolved over many, many thousands of generations um, and I suppose it means you know it's natural selection in action the birds that use the most sensible routes are the ones that survive and then pass on their genes um, and you know there is obviously this genetic um, inherent aspect to migration so I think it it does kind of ensure that the birds that use the the most sensible routes survive and so that's probably why it's um, it's something that's persisted within the populations. Um, Gene asks, why are the track trackers so big and not the size of a mobile phone chip? Um, good question. Uh, just technology hasn't evolved to make them any smaller yet. They are getting smaller and smaller. But um, one of the things that is really beneficial about ospreys is the fact that um, because they go to West Africa, um, they get a lot of sun and the transmitters have solar panels on the top. And that means that when they're perched on a beach in Senegal, the, the transmitters constantly topped up with um, uh, the battery voltages continually topped up. So it means that they can last for, in some cases, many years. Roy's had birds that have been tagged for eight years or more. Um, and obviously if you had a tiny tag, then you wouldn't be able to have solar panels that are so powerful. So there is a, there is a kind of um, trade-off there. Um, 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 then someone's asking about 3005 on the beach stump. Um, her tag no longer works. Is she or was she last year still with us? She was, um, and she bred successfully last year. So yes, so we're hoping that 30 will be back again this year. So yep, 30 is still going strong. And she, you know, she's, um, what, uh, 16 years old now. So she's, you know, she's a, she's a bird who, you know, has produced quite a number of chicks over the years, and but continues to keep um, coming back. Um, uh, Zoe asks, um, have there been any, any instances that the Joves meet their parents on the wintering grounds and are tolerated? Um, not that I know of, Zoe. I mean, it, it may happen, but um, I don't know of it happening. Um, one thing is for sure is when the, when the young birds return to their natal site as, as adults, as two-year-olds, then they're definitely not tolerated. So they're just treated as any, as any kind of intruding bird at the nest site so i think that you know as soon as they've left on their first migration they become independent and then basically they are a potential rival to that to that to that um breeding pair so um i guess 
in West Africa, would they be maybe, you know, would they beg for food? It's never never happened to my knowledge, but um, you know, who knows? Um, Kate, is there any evidence that male and female pair that the male and female pairs do meet up as pairs once they've migrated south, or do they live quite separately until they return north? No, they definitely, you know, they keep themselves to themselves. So, you know, they are faithful to their same wintering site year after year after year. So once they leave their nest site in August or September, they definitely won't see their mate until the next spring. Not unless by pure coincidence they winter in the same part of Spain or Portugal or West Africa. Um, Ed asks, with male ospreys being so site faithful to their natal site, is it unlikely they'll colonise new sites like Ireland, where I am? Um, yes, Ed, that is, a, that is a, a factor that results in the geographical spread of ospreys to be really slow. So one of the ways we've overcome that as conservationists is through translocation projects. So the Rutland population was established through translocation and there's an ongoing translocation project in um, Paul Harbour in Dorset and that's really about restoring ospreys to areas where they used to breed um, so it's a really effective technique that was developed in North America and is now used across Europe um, it was pioneered in Europe at Rutland Water so um, yeah it's a it's an effective way to restore them to parts of their former range um, right we're not far off the end of the questions but I'll just do five more minutes um, uh, Sheila asks, talking of translocations, do you think the proposed Suffolk consultation for a translocation project will be approved? Um, I hope so, Sheila. Um, you know, I think there's a really strong case to move young ospre ospreys from Rutland, where the population is now really secure. And in fact, there's a real um, excess of young males. So it's exactly this point we just talked about, come back to their natal site, then can't breed because there's so much competition. Um, so moving birds fac facilitates the geographical spread of the population. Um, and moves them into you know really suitable habitat so i hope it happens but it's it's really dependent on uh, natural england giving a license um, um david asked um have you got any insight into the synchronicity of arrival by breeding pairs such as such as the manton bay pair that they're they are a really unusual pair that have arrived on the same day i think it's three three years um not running but on three different years which is absolutely remarkable but i think it's just pure coincidence um they they are birds that arrive early every year and the reason they arrive early every year is that that nest um they have a lot of um competition from egyptian geese which try and take over the nest and they they know that if they get back there late then those egyptian geese are likely to take over the nest so i think the fact is there that um you know they just know to get back early um and probably just by by sheer coincidence they they arrive on the same day i don't think they've probably flown back from west africa together it's just it's just chance um, um so we asked has there been any inbreeding in the uk for example this has been proven with peregrines um i don't I, the, occasionally you do get um you know the very nature of ospreys is the fact that you know they do come back to their natal site and so there have been cases in the past i know that rolf in france had a case of a of a young male breeding with his mother um so that will happen on occasion but um generally it's quite it's quite rare um you know there might be the odd sporadic case but it's 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 generally um rare and one of the reasons one of the ways that ospreys avoid inbreeding is by the fact that females will often um, disperse away from their natal colony so um, there's less chance of them breeding with siblings for example um, because females very often end up elsewhere so for example the female that's got back to the dovey nest today um, is one that originally fledged from the manton bay nest at rutland water whereas all the males um, in the rutland population fledged from the local area so you know there is a there is a difference there um, Jim asks, why do ospreys simply fly down the coast of Africa via Morocco? Um, yeah, good question, Jim. I think um, I think part of it is because that coastline is actually quite um, an exposed coastline um, and fishing is probably quite difficult. But I think also because um, basically the birds know they can survive, um, you know, three, four, five, six days without fish. Um, so it's actually better to 
take a direct route across the Sahara, um, you know, cut the corner by flying across the desert than by sticking to the coastline. So really they're just trying to minimize time in that really inhospitable environment, knowing that they've probably got sufficient um, fuel reserves to get across the um, desert, assuming nothing goes wrong. Um, then there's another question about the um, flying along the African coast. Um, Um, someone asked, Does, could GPS in the future somehow be relocated to, say, a hollow version of the Darvik ring? I think that's possible. You know, I think if, if technology is evolving all the time. So I'm sure that, you know, people in 100 years time will look back and think uh, and look at the archaic um, technology we're using now that we think is just totally cutting edge. So, yeah, I'm sure that that will be the case. And then that obviously offers so many more um, opportunities. So some no doubt some technological genius will come along and do that at some point. Um, um, Joyce asks, would, will you recommend Juge National Park, National Park as the best place to see ospreys? Um, not necessarily. There's, you know, many places in um, West Africa that are fantastic for ospreys. Um, um, and I think um, probably um, if you were going to go to West Africa and look for ospreys, one of the best places I've ever been to is a place called the Simone Lagoon which is in um, Senegal, not far from Dakar. Um, and that, yeah, is just a, a really fantastic place for um, seeing them fish. There's a, and there's a really nice place you can stay um, right, right on the edge of the um, lagoon. And you can go down to the mouth of the Simone River there and you can sometimes see three, four, five ospreys fishing simultaneously, just you know, a few meters offshore. So you know, fantastic. Um, but likewise, there's lots of places in the Gambia where you can go and see them. Um, uh, Karton, Gunjur in the Gambia are fantastic. So um, yeah, it's well worth if you're able to get to to West Africa. It's, it's a fantastic experience. Um, Fergus asked me, um, will there be any more reintroduction programs in the UK? In Kent, for example, I think I know why he's asking me that. Um, well, there might be a translocation project in, um, in Suffolk, potentially. Um, and then if that happens, well, hopefully Kent somewhere, the birds um, will eventually recolonize themselves. I mean, the other thing that we know works with ospreys is, is the provision of artificial nests. So that's something that we you know, will always encourage people to, um, to put up. Um, Sam asks, how many osprey pairs nested in the UK last year? Um, something like 300 pairs. So there's about 28 pairs in England and Wales, um, and then all the rest in Scotland. There's probably over 300 pairs in Scotland now. So, um, yeah, uh, really, the, the populations are looking very strong. Um, um, any update on Paul Harbour re returning birds, for example? Not yet, but it's still really early, so I'm sure that... Um, hopefully CJ7, which is the female who's become resident at Paul Harbour, will be back She's around about the 1st of April. She returns every year. So hopefully she won't be um, um, far behind. Um, and Rob asks, following the shooting in Malta, how many are lost in this way? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I'm sure there are. Um, you know, we know that there are real hotspots for illegal killing on the migration route. So um yeah i would say that um probably they are um you know, the situation in malta is absolutely appalling and you know clearly there are lots of people working very hard to try and stop that but um all through the the mediterranean and the middle east so particularly birds on the eastern flyway through europe are really at threat of of illegal killing sadly um so it's still a, a real problem Okay, um, Joshua asks, um, is the rock rutland population now at its maximum capacity or are breeding pairs more territorial and holding larger territories than they would in an untouched state? Um, estuarine breeding populations in America, for example, have very dense breeding populations. Is there the possibility that rut rutland population will eventually increase even more? Um, yeah, I think there is, um, Joshua. Yeah, I think that there is space for more pairs. Um, you know, there's certainly food availability. Um, but I think, you know, the, the American and um, European birds are slightly different. There's nowhere in, in um, Europe where they breed at the same densities that they do in North America. I mean, some of the estuaries like 
Chesapeake Bay and places like that. They're 30 meters apart. In Florida, they can even nest on the same tree. So there are differences, but I think that, you know, potentially there is still potential for more pairs to become established at Rutland um, for sure. Um, Gary asks, you mentioned that Eastern and Western Ospreys are now considered separate species. Apart from the geographical area, what makes them different? Um, just some differences in size. Um, so the Australasian ones tend to be a bit smaller um, and also paler. Um, and there are some genetic differences as well. So there's, you know, those differences are deemed by some, but not all to, to regard that as a, as a separate subspecies. Um, uh, Darren asks, will they use Rutland fledgings to populate the new Suffolk programme or will they use Scottish birds? Um, well, the plan, if that project was licensed, would be to move a small number from, from um, Rutland, but it is only a small number um, because we, we think that it would be really pertinent to try a small scale translocation just to facilitate the geographical expansion of the population. Um, and then with the numbers passing through um, you know southern parts of the uk every year um once you've got a few breeding ospreys that inevitably attracts others so um yes the plan if it goes ahead would be to uh, move birds from rutland um yeah uh, valerie says that mrs glass uh, glass and mrs g mated with her son to that in 2000 from 2015 several times so yeah there you go um it does happen and the last one is how close can you place artificial nests in Rutland? Well, um, we tend not to we tend not to position them any closer than about a mile because if you put them too close together, um, then you tend to get a bit of interference between breeding pairs. I mean, you know, when you look at America and you see them nesting every thirty meters or even in the same tree, perhaps that's being too cautious. But we've just found that with the smaller population, it's better to spread them out that bit further. So yeah, we tend to leave them about a mile apart. Um, and that's it. So I think I've got to the end of the questions. Um, thank you very much to everybody um, for joining me tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's made donations. If you still would like to make a donation, if you've enjoyed the talk, that'd be lovely. Um, the website is ospreylf.org forward slash donate. Um, but otherwise, I just hope you've enjoyed um, the talk. Um, it's well worth having a look on the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation website for some of this stuff on satellite tracking so roydennis.org um, and obviously there are so many fantastic osprey um, webcams around the country now just have a look some brilliant ones so um, you'll be addicted if you're not already um, anyway thank you very much for joining me um, and hopefully at some point soon i'll be able to actually see some of you in person it'd be nice rather than just talking to my computer screen but um yeah thank you all very much and um hope to see you soon